What's up, my friends? Welcome to the Board Game Design Lab. Today, we're talking about IPs. We're talking about licensed intellectual property. We're talking about what it looks like to make a game based on a TV show, a movie, a comic book. And we're talking to Daryl Andrews, a veteran, a guy that's done quite a few of these licensed IP games. Daryl, welcome back to the show. Ah, thanks for having me back. I love the show. Yeah, man. I really had a lot of fun with you last time. And we were talking about, you had like, I don't know, 11 different games we were working on and at different stages and getting signed and getting published. And here we are, I don't know, I guess a year and a half, two years, I don't know, it's been a while. And here you are. And I'm assuming you're still spinning like 47 plates at the same time. Am I right? Yeah, sadly. Uh, same <laughs> same deal. Lots of lots of games in the air. Yeah, absolutely. Any idea on how many games you have right now that are in like active, not just ideas, but are active with potential to be published? Oh, man. That is a scary number. I try not to think <laughs> about that number, actually. <laughs> a little overwhelming, huh? Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to I'm trying to even get my act t- together because I'm coming up to a convention that I'm about to attend. But I was just a couple months ago at New York Toy Fair and we do we did a spreadsheet of like the games we were pitching and the and the companies we were meeting with. And I think we were meeting with something like twenty five different publishers the font was so crazy small on the spreadsheet <laughs> and i think we had 25 game titles as well so it was like this 25 by 25 grid and that was just games that we thought were kind of like mass market wow that's crazy man but i'm excited for it. you got a lot of really cool stuff in the pipe you know we were, we were just talking about about before the, the we started recording and i'm super excited you've got some really cool stuff coming along and uh things you can't talk about unfortunately right now but i'm excited to talk about some of the things you have worked on the things you have published that are different licensed ip games uh, but before we get into that let's remind people who you are things have changed you know you're, you're in a different place now than you were last time you were on the show so kind of give me your quick bio and uh that kind of thing yeah absolutely so i'm still uh designing games freelance for a variety of publishers, but I also just in the last year uh, started up uh, kind of a game studio or a game publisher called Maple Games. And so technically, I guess I'm called the president of that, <laughs> which is a weird thing to say. Uh-huh. <laughs> and uh, so, so far we've, we've published a couple games. Uh, we published uh, Dragon Boats by uh, Michael Schacht and we did uh, Imagineers by Chris Leader and Ken Franklin. Both of those were kickstarted successfully and were in the production cycles, hoping to deliver those in the next few months. So that's really exciting and fun to be part of that process. Um, and then, yeah, I've, I've uh, signed on to do a few games for a few different publishers while at the same time trying to make games and pitch them the other direction to publishers and find homes for them. So that's that's the main uh, gist of my my life right now. Yeah, awesome. Well, hey, let's jump into licensed IPs. But before we get really into it, what what is that? What does it even mean to, uh, for like what is a licensed IP, and what does it mean to design a game for one? Yeah, absolutely. So in general, and, and maybe this is more just my experience, um, licensed IPs are like you said, kind of during the intro. Often they're like TV shows or comic books or or movies or different things that worlds have already been created. And so because those worlds are already created. Um, you're kind of dabbling in someone else's sandbox. And so often I've either been hired to make a game ahead of time for a specific IP, or I've had games where someone has seen it and they've wanted to have me kind of develop the game in the direction of a a specific license or um, a specific intellectual property. And so in either case, uh, there's, you know, some rules that you have to uh, kind of stick to. You can't really like have things happen in your game that wouldn't happen in that universe. So anything like an example of a license, a license that I would love to work with someday, but I haven't before it, but I've heard this as an example is like Disney. So you can't have Disney characters interacting with each other that wouldn't naturally interact with each other. You got to keep, you know, certain characters in their own different worlds, even though they're all Disney, they still have certain rules like that certain people are good. Certain people are the bad guys, you know, certain things like you have to focus on keeping them in their in their storylines and keeping them interacting with the characters that they would normally interact with. So that's an example to me of where you're trying to respect the world that um, someone's already established and you get to play in their sandbox by their rules. Yeah, gotcha. And so with all this stuff, everything has to be approved. That's another thing that is part of this process. I think a lot of people don't realize is people want to like kind of like Disney, they want to stay on brand with their stuff. And so you have to go through a long approval process with everything you do. Is that right? 
Absolutely. So not only is there, so a lot of the times, like for example, I worked for IDW uh, Games for a year. I was a consultant for them. And uh, while there, we would regularly pitch two different license holders. Hey, wouldn't you love to have a game set in your world? And the game would be this. And we'd give them kind of a general idea, you know, a pitch sheet, and we would try to acquire the rights. But we would already kind of give them a vision or idea for a game. So I actually on a weekly basis would write up these pitch sheets um, for different, you know, ideas we could brainstorm. Once we acquired the rights, we would actually then go out and get a designer to make that game. And so um, at the time, because my focus was on acquiring, um, you know, designs and also acquiring designers, I would even go out to conventions and already kind of be looking for something that would fit. But once they were involved, there's, like you said, a ton of times where you have to go back to the license holder and keep getting approvals. You have to keep checking in and say, do you like this direction? You know, what components can we use? Um, what kind of price point? You know, is this character's card match, you know, what that character would do? Like, do you envision this is appropriate? You know, things like that. You have to keep checking in. And all along the way, the license holder can just be like, nope, we're done. I don't like this. So you really have to keep making sure you're keeping them happy. Yeah, absolutely. Now, something you just mentioned was the word rights. So tell me or explain to me like what that means exactly to have to have the rights to a certain IP. Like, how does that work? Absolutely. So uh, my very first game with a license that I got to work on uh, was Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles with IDW. And it was actually a game that uh, Kevin Wilson was the designer for. And I just was brought in just to help a little bit. Um, phenomenal game that Kevin designed. Uh, but we had to keep checking in with the rights holders of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Now, the nice thing there is that the rights holders of Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles work directly with IDW. And so it was an IDW game, but even Kevin Eastman himself, one of the original creators, was still attached to the license. Now, sometimes the creators will sell it off to a company like, there's a little bit of confusion, but like, for instance, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles is shown on Nickelodeon. Mm -hmm. So Nickelodeon has some rights. But also, if you deal directly with, for instance, Kevin Eastman, you know, he still has an authority on his, on that product. So mm -hmm. a nice thing with, for instance, working with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and kind of one of the cool things, is that everything Kevin was making uh, and the things that I helped, you know, uh, shape, especially in the rule book, in the, in kind of in the um, scenario booklets, Kevin was actually giving his approval to those because he was the rights holder and he was giving approval. Yeah, I like this. I like that. And so, for instance, for that scenario, uh, Kevin had a lot of trust and a lot of authority, but they still had to check in with them on a regular basis. And that was even with someone who's directly connected to the company. Gotcha. So is it really just based on how the contracts get written? Yes. Yeah. So another, another example, um, which is kind of an interesting scenario was I did, uh, the third game for the Oregon trail. Mm -hmm. And so the first couple of games were card games. And then the rights holder was actually um, Pressman games. And so some people may even recognize that name because it's kind of a classic uh, board game company. You see them in a lot of like big box toy stores and things like that. And Pressman had acquired the rights for the Oregon trail computer game. And so they were able to continue to make these games so, for instance, the first couple, they decided to make, you know, something small and just very much like a novelty card game that was more about humor and more about just kind of triggering that nostalgia. And they were very successful with that. And what they decided with the third game was they would like to do one that was more of a strategy game. And so then they brought in myself to design that for them. And because they still had the rights, they still had a contract that was open to continuing to make those games, then they they could continue to make more and more games within that kind of that contract. However, the catch for that game, for instance, is they made a deal with target. They made a target exclusive. And so that game every few weeks was presented to target and target would give their notes and then it would come back to us and we would make changes based on targets notes every few weeks. Wow. Gotcha. I th see, I think there's a lot of stuff people just don't realize. They don't realize how hard it is to get one of these games to market because there's so much you have to do, so long the process takes for all these approvals, so many things going back and forth. There's a lot more to it than just, I designed a game and slapped a theme on it. I, I feel like people just don't 
don't grasp that. And let me, some of the other games you, you've designed with IPs, Back to the Future, Orphan Black, you mentioned Oregon Trail, Space Invaders, Ghostbusters, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, and then there's an upcoming Marvel game that we can't talk too much about because it hasn't been announced quite yet. And so you've got a lot of experience in this. Like, Tell me how some of these other games came to be, right? I've had so many people in the Facebook group or even personal emails, they'll say, hey, I got an idea for a game based on this Netflix show or based on this movie or based on this comic book. What do I do? How do I, you know, acquire the rights or how do I approach a company? Like, what's the process? So tell me some of the other experiences you've had in these other games that you've uh, worked on. Yeah, so each of them kind of have a different story and and that's where at the end of the day, I'd have a few different pieces of advice. But let me tell you some of the origin stories of those and you can see a few examples Uh, For example, Back to the Future um, came about just because I was working as a developer for the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles uh, game that Kevin had designed. And because that working relationship was good, and and this is where I say to people, try to get your foot in the door any way you can with a publisher that you you like and with people that you want to work with. Because of that working relationship went well, I then became privy to some of their needs of games they were looking for. And and like I said, once, you know, fast forward, I ended up working for IDW as a consultant. But before that, I actually got the opportunity to back to the future. And that was only because I, I was offering to help in different ways. And they said, hey, could you design a little dice game that would be back to the future themed? And uh, for myself, uh, I'm a huge back to the future nerd. Um, and so that became like, you know, high on my wish list of a dream, you know, product that I would love to be part of. And so I, I designed, I feel like 50 games trying to get them to approve one of them uh, for, (laughs) for that license, because I was determined that I would love to be just a little piece of that universe. And uh, because of that experience, I learned, I learned too, like kind of the process because um, you know, this is maybe, I don't want this to sound like I'm complaining, but this was a learning experience to find out that sometimes even when you pitch your game the way that you think it would be great, they they will change it on you. They will, uh, uh, depending on the publisher and depending on the needs, in that circumstance, they ended up having, they were pitching a bunch of different ones. And the minute they got one approved, they just like published it right away without tightening up. Like for instance, in that game, I thought there was going to be different graphics involved. And so my prototype had kind of a storyline of um, Biff's uh, almanac and all these different items that uh, were, you know, were getting to the wrong timelines and you were trying to collect them and get them back to the future kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, it just got kind of changed into just the abstract mechanic of the game, Mm -hmm. which in the end still, you know, I love that I'm part of that universe. I was really proud of the mechanic of it, but some people look at that game and they go, Oh, well, it's just very abstract. And I go, well, you know, (laughs) that wasn't the original idea. But again, it was tied to that world and it was tied. The whole game is about kind of trying to uh, get your dice to line up in a certain timeline and you can cause uh, time paradoxes. And Mm -hmm. so because you can cause those paradoxes, you can make people go back while you move forward trying to get collect 1.21 gigawatts. So it's still very like thematic even abstract but it was an example of like even learning early on that when you're working with licenses things can really change on you and you have to be pretty flexible because like i was saying earlier the license holders and the publisher they all are trying to kind of get this game out there as um, as well as they can but sometimes as fast as they can because the license is is kind of a limited opportunity yeah, absolutely. Because a lot of times these contracts, you only have a certain window yeah. to get it out there. And I know with like the NFL, you have to pay like every year, you have to kind of yeah. re-up. And so if you don't get that game out in this year, you're paying for nothing. And yeah. so, you know, a lot of times these things get turned around really quick. And I think that's actually going to relate to a question I have in a minute. But I feel like, so would you say with in these relationships, the, as a designer, you have much less control than with, you know, if it's just a game you came up with? Yeah, I would I would say significantly less control. But, but with that said if you can be open to changes and you have a good working relationship, you can still be involved in the process. And you, you know, as long as you can work hard and get involved as soon as possible, you know, even with limited time, you can still make the adjustments you need and try to deliver a really excellent game. That's thematic while also being a really good game. Yeah, definitely. All right. So tell me maybe some of the other origin stories. 
Yeah. So, I mean, so that was an example of kind of, I already had a foot in the door. Uh, some games I've been just straight up contacted and contracted to make a game. So for, for instance, Space Invaders was an example of a publisher who unfortunately is not uh, around anymore, but they were, they just contacted me out of the blue and asked me to make them a game. They had certain restrictions. I think this is a really interesting thing is in general, a lot of licenses will have certain restrictions that limit the scope or the possibilities uh, of what you can make. So for instance, a couple of their limitations were their price point. They had to be a certain price point and which is just a really interesting restraint for designers to, to make sure that you're really mindful of the components you use while you design. And then a, another one is the type of components. So for instance, in Space Invaders, uh, the idea was that they were limited to, to dice, um, but that we couldn't use cards, we couldn't use different things like that because those rights were given to someone else. And so, oh, so like the Space Invaders card game, somebody else held the rights to? Sure, exactly. So yeah. you couldn't even have any cards in your game at all? No. So wow, that's, okay. So that's an example of like, while you're designing and thinking of different things, there, you know, there, people will later on look at a game and go like, why didn't they do this? And sometimes it's because, because someone else owns the rights to that. I know I've been <laughs> part of um, Dragon Ball Z as an example where they... Uh, IDW now has, I think, three or four games out in that world. But originally, uh, when we first got the rights while I was there, it was fascinating. We were given the dice rights, but we couldn't have cards. We couldn't have a board. A board's a really interesting one that often will be allowed or not allowed. And Mm -hmm. uh, we couldn't have miniatures. And that was because all of those were rights given to different companies. Wow. And so it was fascinating at the time. It was a really cool kind of uh, coming together of events. Chris Bryant, uh, phenomenal designer, and uh, ended up making the game. And the funny part was we were just chit-chatting. I was just looking at games at conventions and had that in the back of my mind, look for a cool dice game that could be translated into Dragon Ball. And as I was talking to him, I said, hey, just out of curiosity, what kind of uh, jobs have you done in the past? And he started talking about how he used to be at Funimation and he worked on Dragon Ball Z as an editor. And I just thought, no way, this is crazy. And I said, you know, have you ever dreamed of or thought of making a game in that universe? And he was like, oh, that'd be my dream come true. You know, I love board games, but, you know, I was really sad when I left there. And so it was like this really fun moment of just being like, hey, make your dream game. But just make sure you don't use a board or cards or yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he was like, "All right, I'll try to do that." So, yeah. so that's where sometimes the license is up front. Um, other times, like uh, I can't talk in detail, but the the Marvel game I have coming out, um, it's going to be coming out at Gen Con. The funny thing with that game was I was at Essen talking to uh, the the uh, inventor relations person for for Spin Master, and they were talking about, oh, well, we're working on this and this game. And I said, oh, that that sounds really cool. Can you tell me more about it? And he said, well, we're having a little problem with the design because, um, you know, we started with the mission of blank, and the game has morphed into a really cool game, but not as necessarily a great fit for this license anymore. And I said, well, what was the original plan? And when he described it, I had a game that matched exactly what he described. And so we just, I, you know, eventually was like, Hey, can I just send you the files and the video, which I already had ready and sent them over. And, and the fun part is uh, they played it like the next day and we're like, Oh, we need to, we need to talk like this is the solution. So sometimes it's uh, serendipity. Sometimes it's just the right fit. Maybe it's the right person um, or the right opportunity. Um, you know, I've designed where I specifically have a license in mind. Um, even a, a funny one that I just did for this last New York Toy Fair, and this isn't fit when it comes to a license for TV or movies, but uh, one of my favorite games in the last few years was uh, Ice Cool. Mm-hmm. And I, I just think it's a super fun little universe that they've created. And so Erica Boyoris and I challenged ourselves. We started making a certain game. And we thought it could fit the ice cool universe. Now we pitched it to them and they took it for a evaluation. No idea if it'll ever get picked up, but that's an example of a game we, we designed and it started going down the path of a very specific publisher 
And we thought, well, okay, well, we'll pitch it to them. If they turn it down, that game's probably dead. Like there's really no other Mm -hmm. way to go about it. So it's kind of like a high risk, high reward shot. But all that design time's kind of kind of lost if uh, if it's not a good fit for them. Yeah, definitely. I think that's the risk you run. If anytime you design a game with the intent of a specific theme, or you're thinking, "Hey, this would be really great in this comic book universe," because if you're doing the game right, it should be so married to that theme that you can't really pull it out. I mean, if, if I guess there's ways you can just kind of slap on themes and whatnot, and that happens all the time. But I feel like you're really like so many people I talk to, they love a certain movie or they love a certain comic. And so when they design a game, it is, it is that like, there is no, Oh, I had this idea. And oh, yeah, I guess this could kind of work. Like, no, they, they really dream it big. And so I feel like you're running a risk of, of kind of like you're saying, wasted time. But another thing that I think you're bringing up over and over again is so many of these, these origin stories are built on relationships. You knew people or people knew you. And then through conversations, through contacts, through different things, all of a sudden you've got a game signed with this company based on this theme. And so I feel like that's another thing that people can take away from this game design is not, is not good in a vacuum, right? You really need to get out there, meet people, network, go to conventions, you know, stop by people's booths, shake their hands, talk to them and just kind of get more involved in the industry. If you want to really work on some of these games, because it's probably, they're not just going to knock on your door if they don't know who you are and say, Hey, we, we got an idea for you. No, I mean, it's an excellent point for sure. And I, I do attribute like a significant a- amount of my success is that uh i've been able to meet some incredible people and through you know just being there and being in the right place and building relationships um opportunities you know your shot uh comes up and and that's not to say that they always land you know there's lots of times that people have said to me hey make a game like that you know i'd be interested and i i've tried and i've either been like ah you know i spent a few months working on that and just nothing clicked you know, that can happen or it can be like you, you make something, you pitch it and then they go, well, this wasn't one of your best. So, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, it's not going to always work out, but at least, uh, being in the position to get to work on something, I think is really important on building those relationships. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Let's switch gears just a little bit. Uh, let's talk about, so one of the things that comes up a lot with IP games is how awful, they are. And I think that was just like the stigma and still kind of is, has been for a long time that any game with a licensed IP is probably not very good. And I think you've mentioned or alluded to a couple of reasons why so far, but what would be your ideas on why some of these games just, they flop, they don't evoke the theme as well as a, a person feels like they should like, you know, it's supposed to be Mario, but it really doesn't feel anything like Mario or supposed to be, you know, insert theme here. And it's just yeah. like, what this is, what is this? Why do you think that is? Well, yeah, I mean, I already mentioned before some of the challenges that publishers are within, you know, sometimes it's, it's limited time or lim- limited uh, resources. They've already spent so much, for instance, on the license. People don't understand how expensive licenses can be, but if you're spending a significant additional cost, on just the opportunity to stick their name on the box, that's going to limit what components you can put in the game. So um, so those are real practical factors. I think also, too, the biggest issue is the past. And so uh, in the past, we had some just really bad games that then passed for, you know, got to the market just because they had, you know, something plastered on it. And because that was plastered on it, you know, grandma bought enough copies for Christmas that 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 was good enough and so some companies you know really stayed there and were fine with that but i i i feel a significant uh kind of a shift in in our market now now because it's so competitive a license is not enough a game even with the most popular license will not survive in our marketplace and game companies are taking it more and more serious about getting great designs i think of Kind of an example that I always point to is uh, Hogwarts uh, Battle, with which was uh, published by, at the time they went by USA Opley, now called The Op. And uh, the design team there included uh, Andrew Wolf as their lead game designer, and he's a phenomenal game designer. And so there's an example to me of a game that got a ton of people um, interested in deck builders through the experience of playing a licensed game. And more and more now we're seeing these kind of games popping up where people go, oh, it's a really good game and it's a license, which shouldn't be such an extreme thing to have to point out both. Mm-hmm. But right. um, I think I think that's going to become more and more uh, a significant trend is that people are going to respect 
the fandom, but also make incredible games. I think also one of the biggest uh, difficulties is that when when making a game for a license, a lot of the times there's kind of a misunderstanding that it's going to be a heavy game. But one thing that we need to remember is that that world, that fandom doesn't necessarily aren't all necessarily gamers. Right. And so a lot of these games uh, are opportunities to be on ramps for new gamers. And so they might be a little on the lighter side or they might be a little different than what all of our kind of heavy strategy games might implore. But I think it's a great opportunity to share um, gaming with more people. And so sometimes I think licensed games get a bad rap because kind of our gamer communities kind of are a little snobby to the idea of, of some simpler or lighter games out there. Yeah, I think that's a great point. And going back to what you're saying, as far as, you know, a theme or a license alone is no longer a guarantee for anything. There's been so many games that have gone to Kickstarter that have just not done nearly as well as I would have expected. Uh, either they didn't fund or they were you know, needing a hundred grand or something like that. And they only made 50. So, you know, something like that, it's just, or, or if they did fund, it was just barely, you know, it wasn't like this big mass, uh, massive campaign like you would expect for that license to have. And so, yeah, I think the, the, the bar has been raised so high that, and there have been so many good license games coming out lately that, yeah, it's, it's a different market. You can't just buy a license and go, yep, yeah, we'll just slap, slap, a you know, the name on the box and throw some crap in there and it'll be fine. Like it just doesn't work anymore. Yeah. No. So an example to me of like a light game that I got to be part of designing, there was a game called uh, Ink Monsters by uh, Erica Bioris and I. And we did that with a smaller, less known uh, publisher, Albino Dragon, who really is uh, a one a one person company. Uh, Eric Dahlman, wonderful dude, uh, loves games. You know, he's a, a dear friend of mine now over the years of getting to know him, but he's been at all the shows, slinging his games. He made a great game, Goonies, with uh, uh, Matt and Ben, uh, Matt Riddle and Ben Pinchback. And for the most part, he usually does licensed card decks. That was uh, really what got him found, found his niche was uh, on Kickstarter that a, a few years back was a huge thing for him. Now, the irony is he always wanted to make games, but that's what was working then. Well, the market has changed now and there's less of a demand for that. And now he's finding he can actually do some games uh, more because you know he can do that but the irony was we ended up doing this ink monsters game that was not a license but because of his relationships with even license holders we ended up getting to make a ghostbusters version because yeah. of his connections and already doing a ghostbuster deck so i think even like the the fun part was that was a game that we thought was a really good game small audience and we actually got to expand the amount of people that got to discover the game by making it a Ghostbusters version. We did have to adapt some things because we're fans of Ghostbusters and we really wanted to lean into that theme. But that was an example of you're already capturing monsters. Well, it's not a far stretch to then adapt that into capturing ghosts and, and kind of going in that direction. So uh, that's, to me, even another way that you can make a really good game that then has license potential and then down the road, look for ways to adapt it to other licenses that you love. Yeah, absolutely. And let's kind of keep traveling down that road. Whenever you're working on one of these types of games, how do you like, tell me your process for really evoking the theme. Like with TMNT, did you go and watch a hundred episodes of the cartoon? Like what do you, what do you do to really make sure you're, you're bringing out as much theme as you can? Yeah, no, that's, that's a fun question. So, I mean, first of all, yeah, you just immerse yourself in as much of it as you can. So it's like cartoons, comics, uh, especially depending on what world, you're sliced in. So sometimes you are only working in one of those kind of universes. Uh, so you're going to dive into that kind of stuff. Another thing that's significant to me is, is kind of reading the uh, fan blogs and the reddits and stuff like that. Cause that's where you're going to normally find some of the, some of the people that are most passionate about, uh, about the subject matter that you're working on. Uh, so I think that's always a really important place to, kind of read and observe, maybe even interact. Most of the time I kind of lay low um, and just kind of observe and try to gather as much intel as I can. Um, most of the time too, there's going to be things that just kind of lend themselves. So you start seeing like a, a weapon or, a, or a, a, a maneuver that happens in that world or that universe. And you start thinking about that in board game terms and try to think of ways to translate or emulate or wink at 
that in your game. Um, you know, so that that is kind of in that gather intel mode where you're just immersing yourself in the universe. Also, another thing that I say is try to work in universes that you already naturally love. Uh, early on, you know, I would have. I would have worked anywhere, but I just got lucky and ended up being working on products that I already grew up being massive fans of. I mean, I grew up with all the Teenage Mutant Ninja toys. I, you know, Back to the Future, I had watched hundreds of times. You know, I even had lined up to get autographs with Michael J. Fox, you know, things like that. So I was already massive fans of kind of some of the universes that I already got to work in. I think it's really important to just, Say no sometimes to things that aren't a right fit, but then work on the games that you know you have a deep love for because you're going to understand and respect the fans of that that world that much more. And just because you have an opportunity now, you don't want to you don't want to kind of give a half a half effort. You know, you don't want to yeah. do something that that I guess in, in my mind, I think, well, there's probably someone out there that that would have loved to work on that. I mean, it's like it's like Dragon Ball Z, for example. That was that is a universe that I know has a massive following and a lot of people that love it. When that came around at IDW, I mean, I could have said, "Hey, I want to make that game" because I knew it would be a success. But that's not good enough. I I wanted to find someone who was a huge fan of that world and understood it and cared about it, so that they were going to show the respect that game needs. And that's how we're going to get out of this idea that theme games are bad is that we find great, talented designers, you know, men and women that just love that world and, and get the, them the opportunity to, to make the game that they always dreamed was out there. Yeah, absolutely. You, you want to make sure you're doing the theme justice. You're doing the, the Netflix show or the movie or the comic, whatever it is. You're doing it justice by the fans, right? And so if you're not a fan and I don't, I don't, not that you can't, you know, there's, there's a, uh, you know, some stuff I've been working on lately that I didn't know anything about it, about sure. this IP until, until I was, you know, was talking to a publisher friend and then I started getting into it. And the more I got into it, the more I was, like, I just became a huge fan. I was like, right. let me read all these things. Let me absorb all this stuff. Yeah. And so, you know, that, I think that can happen too. Yeah. But like, like you're saying, if it's not a good fit and you get the opportunity, don't do it just for doing its sake. Well, so it's funny. You mentioned one of like falling in love with. So, uh, Maple has signed on for uh, a licensed game that's uh, scheduled to come out in the fall. Uh, it's designed by Jay Cormier and Sen Fong Lim, two okay. designers that I love and, and care about and respect. And they they love uh, this one comic book series called Mind Management. And the creator, Matt Kent, uh, is phenomenal. But I did, I, honestly, I didn't know much about it until them. And then I got to know it only because over the years, both of them would rave about, oh, you got to read this. You got to read this. Well, finally, they made a game in that universe and got to know Matt himself and got Matt involved with the creating of this game. So they actually even got like the licensed creator to come up with some original material and to play the game. He's a gamer from St. Louis. So I got to meet him at Geekway. And I, now I'm a huge fan. I'm a diehard mind management fan. And yet you know, initially getting involved with the project, I was more just a fan of the game. I was a fan of, you know, this is something that I enjoyed. The game is a hidden movement, one versus many. One of my games that I grew up on was Scotland Yard. And so this to me was like a, it starts at Scotland Yard and has almost like a legacy effect in that you unlock more and more rules and there's more and more narratives. And so I was just like, oh, this is like, scotland yard meets like growing into like a gamer legacy experience so i was hooked just from the game and then on top of it now the license just is like the cherry on top yeah that's awesome well hey let's talk about more challenges you've run you've already mentioned quite a few any other challenges that stick out in your mind in making these games yeah i mean there's there's a lot of things that just might come up that um are real curveballs and it could be anything from the you know, we talked about like components and costs. I mean, practical things that have come up like uh, Oregon Trail at one point, um, not only were the components too, quote unquote, expensive, the reason they were too expensive was because of the weight. So that was a weird moment of like thinking through the weight of what was in the box to make sure that it was appropriate or um, license. Here's another weird one. I, I lost, for example, a license that I was really excited about because the 
person responsible for kind of approvals changed within the company. Oh. So the person previously that had approved the game and was we were regularly checking in, person changed, and that, that person had a new vision of how games should be for that company. And so right away, boom, like we were actually canceled and the game no longer fit what they were hoping for and they wanted a completely different design and ended up being even completely different designers. So, I mean, you can you can have some real curveballs where we, for that one game, we had worked almost a year on it and then right at the finish line, you know, it was canceled. So yeah. You can, now do you still get paid anything in that scenario? Like what happens with, with the money side? Yeah. So the money side is, yeah, you don't get anything unless you had negotiated in advance. Um, mm-hmm. What this is one thing that I really advise other designers, especially in the licensed world is that because of those kind of risks, you need to structure deals where you're looking for some type of advance or bonus up front. Uh, for the time that you're going to spend to make the game, I think it's really important to to have a contract in place as soon as possible. A lot of a lot of companies are going to say, "Oh, start working on something in this universe." You need paperwork in place to protect everyone involved, and so I think it's really important to remind designers, even when everyone has the best of intentions, make sure to get contracts signed on the front end. Don't do a lot of work. Because you don't want anyone resenting each other or being frustrated or or in the weird position of having, you know, part of a game, but then they're going to move with someone else. You want things in place. The whole point of a contract is just to set everyone's expectations to be clear. And so uh, my recommendation is, you know, to ask for very concrete kind of milestones in a contract like that, if possible, and and to have... Uh, more advanced than you might traditionally ask for on another design. Uh, the the flip side too is you're probably also going to have a, a, a smaller royalty. So working on licensed games are traditionally for them to afford being able to pursue the license itself. The designer often uh, has to sacrifice a little bit of royalty themselves. The, the, the flip side is that you're probably going to make more sales because of that license. Gotcha. So it kind of balances out, you know, if you're hopefully you're going to sell thousands and thousands of more copies based on license. So the percentage kind of evens up. Yeah. So that, that that's in theory and, and sometimes it works. Um, kind of the rule of thumb that I've heard is that you get about half the royalty you would normally get when you're working on a license game. That's not always true, um, but that's kind of the kind of the general rule. And and the reason for that, like you said, is that that license is is doing some of the heavy lifting. Yeah. And I, I guess something else to think about with publishing, the margins are already so thin. And so then if you have to split that with somebody else, you know, the owner, the rights owner to whatever IP you have, it's just less, even less margin, right? And so yeah. it's just something else to think about as, as a designer. Well, and, and even that quote unquote half of what royalty is coming from the designer, that is still not making up for the license. To give an idea uh, of a uh, percentage, a license could be anywhere from, sure, it could be maybe like two, three, four, or 5%, but it could be up to 15%. And so- Is that 15% on the profit? Like if a game, you know, if I sell it for 50 and I make 20, then it's 15% of that 20 kind of? Yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be off of the, the amount that the publisher makes. So for instance, wow. yeah, if they're selling it for 20 bucks to the distributor, and then that distributor is going to sell it to a store, and then that store is going to sell it to the customer. I mean, that fifteen percent is a lot for yeah. for that little bit that's going to the publisher. So, um, yeah, it's it's a significant cut, and that's with the companies that normally get them. A lot of licenses, you know, I can't as Maple, I can't go up to Marvel and say, "Hey, can I do a, a Marvel game?" I wouldn't even get, you know, in the door let alone get that rate. That rate is because they have a working relationship already established with someone else. Right. So if I have an idea for a licensed IP game, something I've been working on for a while, and then, you know, Colossal or Maple or somebody, they already have the rights to that game. I should approach the company that has already produced games in that universe. Is that what I should do? Yes. I think that's great advice. I often recommend, like, if you already see a licensed version of the game universe that that you enjoy, then that's the company that you should at least start that conversation with. Uh, the nice thing is this this uh, industry is also pretty uh, pretty kind of generous in how sharing. So, for example, 
Um, I had actually made a game with uh, Adrian Adamsku, who I did Sagrada with, and we actually had a third uh, designer, Michael Gugliano, who actually made the Batman game with Richard Launius. The three of us, uh, Michael, Adrian, and I, had made a game specifically for for a, a universe that was a dream license for us. And so we thought, you know what? This is a dream license. We're just going to go for it. And we ended up actually even signing the game with a publisher who had the rights, but they lost the rights uh, after signing our game. But they were generous enough to give us back the game and say, you know, here's another company that might that might have that license in the future. Yeah. So now how do you how do you lose rights in that scenario? Yeah. Well, it could be anything. So uh, you know, maybe uh, something as simple as um, an example that I know of, at least that it came up a few times at IDW, is a movie's coming up, hmm. and so the company kind of gathers all their their licenses that are out there that you know time has kind of expired on them or they they had chance for renewal and they were always renewing but at a certain point a company goes oh you know what we're actually going to pull those all back in and reassess their value and and then reassess who we want to work with uh so that could be an example ownership changes or purchases so companies you know are always moving you know a lot of people joke that asmo day is buying everyone up but that's happening in every industry so you know things like movie companies and studios that end up combining or uh, TV show rights that people decide to to kind of inquire on, then those are scenarios where those licenses become kind of active again and the license holders may change how they manage uh, who's involved with those. So uh, it's, it's kind of a kind of a fluid thing and that's why coming back to the idea of like working fast and and having kind of time constraints on a license is is such a big deal because um even when you kind of secure the rights usually you secure it to x date but and you expect them to renew but they they might not renew um things things are changing in in the background yeah, gotcha, man. There's just so many things that people don't understand about all these things. You know, it's so easy to rag on licensed games and all this and, and to just not have any grasp on how much of the business side of things that, that play into, you know, if these games ever see the light of day. Yeah, there's a and there's a lot of even false starts on their side because it, it, you know, for example, uh, mind management, we're really excited about making the game for this. We've adjusted our timeline a few times already, trying to make sure the game is like perfect for when it comes out. But Mind Management is an example of a comic book series that came to completion and then we inquired, but there's been rumors of TV shows or rumors of movies or rumors of it coming back and then starting a new series set in the same universe. And all those things are things that obviously the original creators are hoping for, but those things might work out. They might make, you know, a pilot and the pilot doesn't take off. But those all are scenarios where it kind of messes around with the timing of licenses. Yeah, that's another great point. But let's uh, switch gears just a little bit. Let's talk about playtesting. What are the challenges in playtesting one of these games? And obviously, a lot of these, a lot of times, these things are under wraps. You can't just post pictures online and things like that. So, tell me about some of those obstacles. Yeah, so it does create um, a few things. It's funny. I always tell, you know, especially newer designers, not to worry about things like NDAs, which is a non-disclosure agreement. Uh, but unfortunately, sometimes you need to do that with licensed products. So, for example, uh, you can find some boiler makers out there or create one yourself or consult a lawyer for kind of a, a simple NDA. But in, in general, what you're asking of your play testers is to respect the privacy of the game. And so you're asking your play testers, unfortunately, to not share about the experience, like you said, not taking photos um, until the appropriate time. Now, hopefully it's not too long and hopefully, you know, things like sometimes those people will get mentioned as playtesters in the rules. And and it's also just fun to be kind of in on the secret. Right. So that that still rewards playtesting those games. But it is also kind of a turnoff because it has to be kind of a secret that you can't talk to others about. Um, the other the other thing that um you mentioned pictures but it also affects where where you can play test so for example there's some games that i've just not been able to say take to a convention um, or i play test it in say my hotel room instead of out on the convention floor um, because you have to be uh kind of respecting the property owners and they might not want 
uh, news of that game to come out yet. We were we were even talking about how um, before the show about the Marvel game, how they they have a very st- strategic and specific time that they will want to start marketing, pre-marketing the game, and it's not yet. So it's an example of something that even though we have everything done, everything is in place. There's still, you know, the license holders have specific marketing strategies and specific even restrictions where they might not even be allowed to publicly talk about something until X date. And so for playtesting, you have to you have to find ways to make sure that the privacy is respected. Yeah, absolutely. Now let's let's talk about the NDA just for a second. Let's say Steve comes to one of your playtests, he signs the NDA, but then he goes home, gets on Reddit, gets on Facebook, and he starts blabbing about this new game coming out and all these different things. Like, what's the what's the recourse? Like, what happens in that situation? Absolutely, it's a great question, and I'm thankful I've never had to deal with that. <laughs> you never uh, had to go find Steve and break his kneecaps or anything. I, I haven't had to do that yet. No, uh, I have a friend that does that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> That's right. I know a guy. You know, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, I, unfortunately, the recourse would just be like illegal, like kind of like doing defamation. Um, you know, if there was any quote unquote damages that you could prove, uh, there would be you know financial legal recourse because of them signing an NDA. I've never had to pursue that. And, and there is kind of a discernment side on, on the designer side, you need to be careful who you play test with. And so it's not just anyone willing to say yes, but do you know these people and do you trust these people? Cause it is an important thing. And it's not even, I would, you know, I'm not saying I would never pursue the, the legal side of it, but actually what it hurts more is it hurts that designer ever having a chance to work in, licensed products again because um they're really kind of undermining the designer and so it it stops them from maybe getting to work on future cool projects so i think more than anything it's you know thankfully there's a lot of good people in this hobby and most of the time playtesters are doing it because they're a friend and uh and so just people understanding kind of the ramifications is hopefully enough yeah, absolutely. Well, Daryl, man, this has been super informative, super interesting. Any other thoughts, any other ideas, like any kind of closing statements, for, especially for somebody who, who may be out there listening and thinking, oh, I got this idea for this really cool theme, but I, you know, how do I get the right? Like, what would you just say in general, kind of closing closing thoughts? Yeah, I, uh, well, one thing is actually, I kind of changed my tune. I used to always say to people, like, if there's a licensed game, don't make that license. You're never going to get it. It's impossible. And then I've had this life experience of a whole bunch of things that I did get to work on. So I can't say that anymore. I actually say, make things that you love and make sure they're fun and they're great. And if they, if they need a specific license, then chase that, you know, go for it. It, Companies are shockingly accessible. You know, you can go to a few shows and between a few shows, you can probably talk to almost every publisher. Um, If you, if you arrange ahead of time and try to schedule a meeting you know, there's, there's some tips out there for pitching, but, and anyone that listens to your show is I'm sure heard many of them. So, uh, I, I think, you know, just do it well, like do it really well. And, and then the other thing is, um, I do think things can be adapted. I think, uh, I don't know, maybe it's just cause I've seen how extreme some games have swung in their, uh, in their properties, especially, uh, working for a few different companies and seeing a game start somewhere through the development process, it can really, really be changed into a lot of directions. And there's a lot of ways to still honor, honor a a new license while taking from an old game. So it just, it just takes a lot of work. And so don't be afraid of, of your theme changing or morphing, you know, there just might be some themes that it'll bridge over to easier. And so have an open mind, um, to be able to adapt your games. And that'll also create a lot of opportunity for uh, future license work. Awesome. Well, Daryl, good luck with all these projects. Good luck with all the uh, plates you got spinning and good luck with everything else you got going on right now. Thanks, Gabe.